with the scars, with the hopes and the dreams. Thank you that you work in our lives to help us become everything you have created us to be. And we pray, oh God, that you will quicken in this time of reflection words that touch our hearts, our souls, where they need to be touched and help us heal and grow in service of you and your dream for the world. We pray that everything we do brings honor and glory to you. In your name we pray. Amen. Um, that gift of love was my Valentine's thing, just if you didn't make that connection. Was that nice? Okay. Um, so this week, I was listening to NPR. I tend to listen to it as I'm driving. And there was this interview with this guy. Now, I'm sorry, I don't remember his name. And what I thought was the name of the book or blog that he wrote, didn't show up when I went searching for him, but it was this man who talked about that whole phenomena of becoming a dad. Now, he and his wife had chosen to have a child, and he wasn't prepared for the things that happened in his wife as she became pregnant. It was like all of a sudden she was like really excited about having a baby and wanting to focus on the room, and he's like, wait a minute, I kind of want to, I don't know about this. And apparently he took pictures of her during her pregnancy, and sometimes he used a wide-angle lens. Just a note, future dads, that's not a good idea. And he put it on his blog, you know, because that was, his whole world was getting messed up in his mind. He was really reluctant to this idea of becoming a dad. And then the day his daughter was born, they named her Lulu, and... Um, and he held her for the first time. And as he approached holding her, he expected this amazing love vortex to sweep on him and suck him in. And it didn't happen. It wasn't that immediately I look at you, I see your eyes, and I'm desperately in love with you. Matter of fact, it took him a long time to get that level of, I love you. He even took pictures of the baby girl. You know, most people put pictures up on blogs when they're looking all clean and fresh and beautiful and adorable. He put pictures up when their face was all squirreled up, when they were screaming. It gets better. There are really great times, guys. I promise. It's wonderful. And, and you might not feel like he did, okay? But he, he logged about that whole issue of, you know, I'm supposed to be feeling this way. Everybody tells me I'm supposed to be feeling this way, and I don't feel this way. And I think there might have even been a fear that maybe I'll never feel this way. What have I done? And, and it just points out the whole thing that's going in the Corinthians text. You see, because we have this worldview that everything's supposed to be just perfect. We're supposed to be the perfect Christians right there, right at the very moment. And then even in the Corinthians thing, we get this competition going over. I'm a better Christian than you because Paul did this and I, I'm a follower, you know, and all that stuff. And we get into this whole thing where relationships are a competition, where they're supposed to be even instantaneously deep and meaning and powerful and they never shift because they're just at that nirvana moment at first sight. I could say the same expectations are there when you start to make a commitment to marry someone. You know, I listen to couples when we are doing premarital counseling and I say, tell me your story. And you know, we hear that it's supposed to be like that psalm enchanted evening and you look across the room and there's bells and whistles and fireworks and you know what? I really haven't found a couple that tells that story. So there's this world expectation that we have to portray our lives, our faith relationship, our family relationships, our love, our community relationships in a certain way or something's just not right. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? 
I mean, is it registering with anybody or am I just out here today? And so I think the beauty of what we can take from the Corinthians text is, is that one, our relationships are not to be a competition. I have these relationships in my life. I have this faith walk. And it's my faith walk. And my faith walk is not your faith walk. And whether I was raised in this faith tradition or you were raised in that faith tradition, or if you can trans, you know, do your genealogy back to Peter and Paul as the people who started the line for you to find Christ, it doesn't make a difference. It matters that God is working in our lives. And it's not an instantaneous thing, which is why the, the images of having milk and moving into more sustainable food, why there's planting and then harvest. It's not a boom, one moment, one size fits all, all is world and perfect. You got me? And so that kind of leads to how do we get there? Now, Psalms 119, I just confess, I'm going to become like a psalmist geeky nerd today. On the new, okay? Um, this is a really cool psalm. And if you've ever looked at it, you probably said, no, I'm not going to read this one because it's really, really long and it scares me. So let me just tell you some cool things about it, all right? It's 176 verses. Okay, we've got that out there. You're scared. It's okay. It is... Um, an acrostic psalm in which there are each of the sections of the psalm start with a letter of the alphabet, the Hebrew alphabet, and it goes from Elf to Tov, which is our equivalent to our A to Z, only it's 22 letters instead of 26. Isn't that cool? And then it starts in eight verse groupings. Now, the first one is Aleph, which is like about the Word of God and how the Word of God is supposed to be really center. And then it goes Beth for Beth, and, you know, home and the connection with God. It's really cool stuff, all right? I'm just going to not go any more on my nerd stuff here, okay? Trust me, it's really cool. I'm amazed. I think about somebody sitting down and writing 176 verses, and the first eight are all starting with the letter Aleph, and then Beth, and, and on through the thing. And each of them are, are segmented to kind of convey a thought. So I want to build on this idea a little bit as we're talking about growing happy together today. And I just confess, I realize that really is not a topic I have expertise, so I'm just going to share with you some ideas of my basic ABCs. Okay? We're not going to do 26, we're going to do three. The first one is just to accept. Accept that we're not perfect. Accept that I'm not perfect. Accept that you're not perfect. That, accept that the people around us are not perfect. That we all walk around with broken stuff in us. I saw this really cool thing um, on social media and the quote was, I don't know who it was and I, and I confess it sounds a little cheesy, but it's cute, all right? Everyone comes with baggage. Find someone who loves you enough to help you unpack it. I know it sounds cheesy, but get, it, get the, the core of it. We function in a world in which we're all thought to be perfect. We're not one of those people who have problems in their lives. Everything in our faith is perfect. We have no questions, no qualms. In our faith work, we're right there all the time. That's kind of the expectation that's out there. But the truth is, that's not true. We all have stuff in our lives. And we all have buttons that are in our lives. And whether we know it or not, we go along and all of a sudden somebody touches our button and we're acting out from that button, from that pain, from that woundedness. And so if we can just, first of all, accept that we're not perfect and that those around us are not perfect, and that sometimes buttons are going to get pushed. Our job is to accept them even when the buttons are pushed and accept ourselves, okay? Very simple, hard to do. Tell me, I, I'm not mastered it yet. The B is tying into the blessed part of the Psalms. It actually starts with happy are those, or, or blessed are those who walk in the way of the Lord. Now here is really important because it's talking about living in the Word of God, but it's not 
here. Did everybody see that in the text? It's not about thinking about the Word of God. It's not about memorizing the Word of God. It is about walking with the Word of God. See the difference? Blessed are you who walk in the Word of God. Well, for me, that means I'm like intentionally going along my day and saying, okay, so first of all, I'm kind of going in a companion walk with God, and I'm going to be saying, God, speak to me today, or speak to me through your scripture today. What words do I need to hear, and how do I need to live my life as I walk with you? And there's some really good parts about that. That your heart is straight is one translation. Well, I'm sorry about this, but I, I confess I don't have a, a straight heart. Sometimes my heart is all cattywampus because of my stuff. And so when it talks about straight heart, it talks about righteousness in your heart. That God's love and Hopes and dreams are working and healing in your heart. And so it's a blessing to be able to walk in your daily life. To try to live out God's life in your world through your life. That's the B. It's blessed. You're not purposely going out there trying to stir up stuff. You're not creating jealousy. You're not gossiping and all that stuff. You're walking with the mind of God in your daily life. The C is courage. We live in a world where we're programmed. How's your day? It's great. How are you? I'm fine. Am I not telling the truth? We don't say, you know, my beloved just died. I just found out that the one I care about has cheated on me. We say, I'm fine. That hasn't happened to me, though, just to make sure. You know what I'm saying? Our world can be crushing around us as somebody says, how are you? And what do we say? I'm fine. It's okay. God is good. God is awesome. It takes courage to be transparent with one another. And I think that's one of the ways we move forward in growing to be happy with each other. Is that when things happen to us, we have the courage to be transparent with one another and say, you know, I'm really struggling with this in my life right now. And I need somebody that I can talk to. I need somebody who'll pray with me. Or I need somebody who'll just sit and listen with me. And it's courage to ask for help. It takes great courage. It takes great courage to accept, hey, I'm not perfect. And it takes courage to walk, trying to live the mind of God in our world. So those are the my three ABCs that can help us work and grow happier together. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you that you accepted us, that you desire to walk with us, and that you give us the courage to live out faithful lives. Help us, O oh God, to be able to try to do these things. That we might become healthier people. That we might become less judgmental Christians. That we might be freed from all the rules and society suggestions just be with you in relationship with you and one another we pause now before you O oh god and we lift up our thanksgiving and the joys and our prayer concerns